This Marian Symposium, I contacted Dr. Miravalle last year and said, you know, I really want to refocus again the attention on the co-redemption. It seems that we lost focus for a while, and I would maybe call this conference or this symposium not just Mary Corridemtrix relevance and remedy for our time, but I told him I would also call it Mary Corridemtrix reboot. You know, that's a new phrase with the computer age that we needed to reboot to start over again, I think, to remind us of the importance of this fifth Marian dogma. Uh, Father Peter Damien fell in with the late Father Peter Damien, who was the first rector of the Shrine Church here, was such a great, um, the- he was a great mind uh, for theology and great man, did a lot to help, I think, bring attention to the co redemption. And he passed away this year on May 8th, providentially, which used to be traditionally the Feast of Our Lady Mediatrix of All Graces. And so we hope that uh, Father Peter, from his place where he is now, can intercede for us in a special way today and during this conference. St. Maximine Colby, he had a brother who was also a Franciscan friar, and uh, he was like his right-hand man. And his brother passed away unexpectedly, I think from tuberculosis or something. And all the friars said to him, well, it's a shame that you lost your brother. He was such a great help to you, and so you're probably going to be missing him sorely. And St. Maximilian Colby responded, he says, no, he will be able to help me even more from where he is now, he said, because in this life, we have to keep one hand, we have to hold on to God, he said, but with the other hand, we can work. He said, but now where my brother is, he said, he can work with both hands because he doesn't have to worry about holding on to God. And so we hope that uh, Father Peter will be able to work with both hands now where he is and that he will especially um, help for this movement and this proclamation of the Fifth Marian Dogma to take place. My talk, the one that leads us off today, is the uh, Mary Corridemtrix Golden Thread of the Modern Marian Apparitions. And I take as the modern Marian apparitions, I begin with 1830 with the apparition of Our Lady at Rudebach in Paris, France. And you say, well, 1830, that's not very modern. But when you look at 2,000 years of history, 1830 is pretty modern. So we're going to start there because also I think it had a great impetus to the proclamation of the Immaculate Conception dogma. It helped... I think, by Our Lady's apparition to Ruta, at Rudebach to St. Catherine Labore, got the Immaculate Conception into the devotional life, especially of the faithful, even more so because of the medal, uh, the Miraculous Medal, which, as you know, the official title is the Medal of the Immaculate Conception. And um, the Immaculate Conception and the Co-Redemption, I think, are very much... Uh, tied together. And I'm saying golden thread, and I'm stealing this phrase from St. Maximilian Kolbe, who said that the Immaculate Conception was the golden thread running throughout the history of the Franciscan order. And he said, from St. Francis until 1854, the sole purpose of the Franciscan order was to work for the proclamation of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. And with that, with the proclamation in 1854 of the dogma by Blessed Pius IX, who was a Third Order Franciscan, he said, St. Maximilian, that first half of the purpose of the Franciscan order has been completed. He said, now from 1854 until the end of time, the purpose of the Franciscan order is to explain what does it mean that Our Lady is the Immaculate Conception. You might say that all the dogmas proclaimed before, the four already defined dogmas of Our Lady, her being the Mother of God, her being the Perpetual Virgin, the Immaculate Conception, and assumed into heaven, have a lot to do with her person, her being. But 
St. Maximin Kolbe said that Our Lady has her being and her mission. What does it mean that Our Lady is the Immaculate Conception? Is that she's my co-redemptrix, she's my mediatrix, and she's my advocate. That's Our Lady's mission. And that's what she does. You might say, what's in it for me that Our Lady is the Immaculate Conception? Because we all want to know, kind of, what do I, what's it mean to me that Our Lady is Immaculate? Well, she's your co-redemptrix, she's your mediatrix, and she's, she is your advocate. So I'm taking that idea of St. Maximian, the golden thread, that not only was it, is it the Immaculate Conception, but especially since 1830, I think that the golden thread also includes this aspect of her being our co-redemptrix. And uh, I'm going to focus on that part. Of course, mediatrix and advocate are there as well, but I'm going to focus on the aspect of her co-redemption as being also a little golden thread that has elements being repeated since the Marian apparitions that I'm going to pick out anyway since 1830. So we start with the Rudabach and Our Lady's apparitions to St. Catherine Labore. And, of course, you know, at Rudabach, Our Lady asked for the Medal of the Immaculate Conception, or what is more popularly known as the Miraculous Medal, to be, cons- to be constructed. She wanted that medal to be made and distributed. We know that uh, the Immaculate, that medal has on the front, you might say, the Glorious Mysteries. It has Our Lady, Mediatrix of All Graces, on the front. And it says, of course, O Mary, can see without sin, pray for us who have recourse to Thee. But on the back, you might say, is the sorrowful mystery and the glorious. The sorrowful mysteries, of course, are there portrayed with the cross, with the M underneath the cross. That, to me, emphasizes especially Our Lady at the foot of the cross. How can you not see in that Our Lady as her co-redemption? And it's interesting that when St. Catherine Labre saw this medal that Our Lady asked her to have made, St. Catherine Labre said she had prayed about. And because not only did, was there the, the cross with the M underneath it, but below that was the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, connected with a bar. And, of course, with the Immaculate Heart, there is a sword piercing her heart. So it even more emphasizes that a fact that Our Lady in her immaculate heart is also the sorrowful heart and that she is suffering for her beloved children. But St. Catherine, when she saw this on the back of the medal, she said this, At the same instant the oval frame seemed to turn around. Then I saw on the back of it the letter M surmounted by a cross with a crossbar beneath it and under the monogram the name of Mary the holy hearts of Jesus and of his mother, the first surrounded by a crown of thorns and the second transpierced by a sword. I was anxious to know what words must be placed on the reverse side of the medal, and after many prayers, one day in meditation, I seemed to hear a voice which said to me, the M with the cross and the two hearts tell enough. You know, I guess Our Lady was trying to tell her, if you can't figure that out, what that the importance of that you don't need any words that it's pretty much symbolizes of course the sacred heart and the immaculate heart Jesus the redemptor and our lady of course the co-redemptrix and maybe just for those of you who are not familiar with that phrase co-redemptrix we hope that through this symposium that it'll become a, a phrase that you will use in your devotional life, that you'll pray and ask Our Lady, especially under the title of Our Lady Choridemtrix, to intercede for you and to pray. That's one of the things we need to become more devoted to. You know, Choridemtrix, Our Lady, we've had that devotion. It's Our Lady of Sorrows. But it brings out the, the aspect of that Our Lady's sorrows was not just uh, for herself. Her sorrows were for our redemption. And of course, co redemptrix, as Monsignor is going to even, I'm sure, explain to you, is not what so many try to think that co meaning somehow co equal. No, that's not what co redemptrix means. Matter of fact, even if you talk about a pilot and a co pilot, 
the pilot does not believe that the co-pilot is equal to him. And a matter of fact, I'm sure the pilot will let the co-pilot know that he's not equal to him. But it doesn't mean that the co-pilot doesn't have some part to play. It's important. The pilot wants a co-pilot to assist him. And so, uh, just um, so we don't get confused by that phrase, as some have tried to use it as a to discredit the term co-redemptrix. But of course it means co from the cum meaning Latin and redemptrix, the feminine counterpart with the redeemer. So we see that very clearly symbolized on the miraculous medal. The woman at the foot of the cross and then even more so those two hearts, which maybe the two hearts devotion that Pope John Paul II would later speak about um, was given an impetus from the miraculous medal where those two hearts are kind of even connected. I mean, God, God, even in Our Lady, kind of connect the dots for us by putting the bar between the two so we can understand that there's a, there's a connection, there's a union with those two hearts. So, Rudabach, Our Lady, the miraculous medal, um, has already the mysteries of Our Lady. That medal of Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception really is a catechetical tool it teaches you all that you want to know about Our Lady on that medal. And part of that is her work in redemption. Then we have in September 19, 1846, Our Lady of La Salette, who appeared to two little shepherds uh, on the mountains around Grenoble, of course, Melanie and Maximin. And she appeared sitting on a rock and weeping, she was sorrowful. Even the children said she was like a mama whom her own children had beaten and who had escaped to the mountain to weep. And Our Lady appeared to the children with a crown of thorns on her head, and on her shoulders was a heavy chain, and from a smaller golden chain hung a resplendent crucifix with a hammer and pincers placed on each side of the crucifix, a little beyond the nailed hands." And the children said that Our Lady wept all the time while she was talking to them. So really we see in Our Lady of La Salette, Our Lady of Sorrows, who she's quite upset and sorrowful with the condition of mankind at that time. And she even said to the children, For how long a time do I suffer for you? However much you pray, however much you do, you will never recompense the pains I have taken for you. So Our Lady's talking about her sufferings at the foot of the cross for love of us, emphasizing her, her participation and that she has suffered for us, for our salvation. And you know, the things that she complained most about at La Salette was the blasphemies, the taking of God's name in vain, and working unnecessarily on Sunday. She even said to the people that on fast days, on Fridays when they weren't supposed to eat meat, they would run like, the butch they would run like dogs to the butcher shop to get meat. That's how badly they had fallen into observing the penitential life of the church. So at Rudabach, Our Lady emphasizes how much she has suffered for love of her children and how important it is to be mindful of her sufferings. Then, of course, the next one that I want to point out is February 11, 1858, Our Lady of Lourdes, when Our Lady appeared to Bernadette, Subiru. And, of course, she said at Lourdes, and later on she would even repeat that through her angel at Fatima, penance, penance, penance. And she told Bernadette to pray and do penance for the conversion of poor sinners. It's also there at, at Lourdes where she gave her name, I am the Immaculate Conception, when she was asked by the parish priest to ask that beautiful lady what is her name. So Our Lady identifies her as I am the Immaculate Conception, and that especially helped fueled, I think, in St. Maximine Colby this whole pondering of the Immaculate Conception and what it meant, because he 
found that to be a great uh, insight into Our Lady's being and her mission. But if you wonder if co-redemption is not a part of the message of Lourdes, Pope Pius XII, in his encyclical, it's the only encyclical that I know that is written on Our Lady of Lourdes, he wrote, In the School of Mary, and I always thought that Pope John Paul II was the one who had coined the phrase, the School of Mary, but it seems that it, Pius XII is the one who used this phrase, the School of Mary. He said, In the School of Mary, one can learn to live not only to give Christ to the world, but also to await with faith the hour of Jesus and remain with Mary at the foot of the cross. Wherever providence has placed a person, there is always more to be done for God's cause. Priests should, with supernatural confidence, show the narrow road which leads to life. Consecrated and religious fight under Mary's banner against inordinate lust for freedom, riches, and pleasures. In response to the Immaculate, they will fight with the weapons of prayer and penance and by triumphs of charity. Go to her, you who are crushed by material misery, defenseless against the hardships of life and the indifference of men. Go to her, you who are assailed by sorrows and moral trials. Go to her, beloved invalids and infirm, you who are sincerely welcomed and honored at Lourdes as suffering members of our Lord. Go to her and receive peace of heart, strength for your daily duties, joy for the sacrifice you offer. So Our Lady of Lourdes is identifying herself with the suffering. And she, as we know, she's not only relieving the physical sufferings, but she, especially many souls who go to Lourdes, go there for confession. And that is where Our Lady, I'm sure, is pleased to see so many healed in that way in the confessional. But we can see very clearly the compassion of Our Lady from Lourdes for the sick, for the suffering, for the, for the sinner. And uh, maybe the waters of Lourdes can in some way be connected with the water flowing from the side of Christ that not only washes us clean in the sacraments, but also through her maternal mediation at Lourdes. In 1917, we go now to Our Lady of Fatima and the co-redemptive elements in the message of Our Lady of Fatima. First of all, the fact that Our Lady appears on the 13th of every month, starting in May. The 13th of the month reminds us of, of course, another 13th of the month in the Book of Esther, that Queen Esther, and you might say Our Lady at Fatima, even brings out this connection with Esther, because if you remember in one of the images of Our Lady as she appeared to the children, not the sorrowful heart one, but her Our Lady of the Queen of the Rosary, there's a little star at the base of her dress, calling to mind in Persian that the word star is Ishtar, from which we get Esther. And that Esther, as you know, that the wicked Haman wanted to destroy the Jews on the 13th of the month of the month of Adar and that Esther interceded on behalf of the people and turned the tables on wicked Haman. And so I think that Our Lady is showing her assistance there as the Corredemptrix in the battle against evil by the fact that she's coming on the 13th of the month as the modern Esther to say to us who are, you may say, being attacked by the wicked serpent himself, who Haman is just a type, to remind us that she's come to give us a message of hope and to help us to make reparation and to obtain the conversion of poor sinners. But she also tells us at Fatima twice. Once she says, God wishes, and then the second time she says, my son wishes to establish devotion to my immaculate heart. Once again, pointing out that that immaculate heart is also that sorrowful heart that has been pierced by a sword. And she said, so many souls go to hell because they have no one to pray for them. 
and she asked them to offer sacrifices for the conversion of poor sinners. You might say that the message of Our Lady of Fatima is very much a message of how we can be a co-redeemer by offering up our sacrifices and prayers. So if you want to know what the work of co-redemption is, uniting our sufferings and sorrows and prayers to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart, that she has that, as later on others will point out, she has a co-redemptrix heart. And of course, at the miracle of the sun on October 13th, which tomorrow will be the 101st anniversary of Our Lady's miracle of the sun, she appears as if we didn't make the connection. One of the things that the children see during the miracle of the sun is Our Lady of Sorrows to point out, I think, the importance of her co-redemption. And that if we're really talking about Our Lady's triumph of her Immaculate Heart that she mentions at Fatima, it's not, if you think that the triumph of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart and that her message or that her wanting to establish devotion to her Immaculate Heart has been satisfied by the fact that we have an, oblig- an obligatory memorial to her Immaculate Heart and next to the Sacred Heart, I don't think that's what she's asking for. She's asking for more than that. I think if you want to talk about the triumph of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart, it means the proclamation of the fifth Marian dogma. That's going to be the triumph of her Immaculate Heart. Father Peter was very much uh, strongly emphasized that the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary is not that she has this liturgical celebration that's only an optional, maybe it's an optional memorial some places, I'm not sure if it's even obligatory. But for her, triumph of her Immaculate Heart is that we recognize her role in the work of mediation and co-redemption and that that dogma is very important for that triumph. It hasn't taken place yet, Our Lady's triumph. I really believe that that God wants more than that for his mother and we'll talk about that later on at Mass. But to f- the fact that Our Lady's co-redemption is a part of the message of Fatima, Sister Lucy said in her calls, the 11th message or the 11th call of Our Lady of Fatima, that part where she said, Jesus wants to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart, she said this, to establish devotion to the Immaculate Heart means to bring people to a full consecration through conversion, self-dedication, intimate esteem, veneration, and love. Thus, it is in this spirit of consecration that conversion that God wishes to establish in the world, devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That co-redemption also has to do with consecration because it's at the foot of the cross where Our Lady was standing as co-redemptrix that our Lord consecrated us to his mother. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. So if you're really wanting to become involved in the work of co-redemption, you must be consecrated to her Immaculate Heart in whatever fashion you want to do it, whether it be St. Louis de Montfort, St. Maximilian Colby. It it has to be, I think, part of that spirituality of of co-redemption. She goes on to say, to begin, God began the work of redemption in the heart of Mary, given that it was through her fiat that the redemption came, began to come about. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. And then she goes on to say, Thus, in the closest union possible between two human beings, Christ began with Mary the work of our salvation. The Christ heart beats are those of the heart of Mary. The prayer of Christ is the prayer of Mary. The joy of Christ are the joys of Mary. It was from Mary that Christ received the body and blood that are to be poured out and offered up for the salvation of the world. Hence, Mary, made one with Christ, is the co-redemptrix of the human race. Sister Lucy very much clearly sees that in the message of Fatima. And, of course, later on she would appear to her in that sorrowful heart uh, image of Our Lady of Fatima to point out that the Immaculate Heart is also that co-redemptive, co-redemptrix, the heart of a co-redemptrix. 
The next Marian apparition of the 20th century, and it seems, especially in the 20th century, with Fatima and this one and the, the last one of the 20th century that I'm going to point out, co-redemption seems to be a very strong message because the next one is in 1945, Our Lady's appearance to Ida Perdman at Amsterdam, Our Lady of All Nations, in which Our Lady, after 1950, because it started in 1945 and the apparitions continued to 1959, that Our Lady, after 1950, with the proclamation of the dogma of the Assumption, asked Ida that a statue be made, or an image be made, excuse me, of Our Lady standing in front of the cross or standing before the cross and with, uh, with her hair without a veil. First, we can see, of course, standing in, at the foot of the cross or in front of the cross, she's an image of Our Lady Cordemtrix. And the hair unbound, you might say, has a biblical imagery of when the Israelites were in, in battle, they would when they were in fight, fighting, you know, they would unbound their hair, that Our Lady is really Im- t- symbolizing that she's in this battle for souls, I think, by that image of Our Lady of all nations. Our Lady at Amsterdam explicitly asked for the fifth Marian dogma of Cordemption, Mediatrix, and Advocate. She said um, to Ida, I am standing on the globe, and both of my feet are set upon it firmly. You also see my hands clearly, as well as my face, hair, and veil. The rest is as in a haze. Now I will explain to you why I come in this form. I stand as the lady before the cross, with head, hands, and feet of a human being, but with the body, however, of the Spirit, because the Son came through the will of the Father. The Father and the Son want to bring me into this world as co redemptrix mediatrix, and advocate. This will be the new and final Marian dogma. This image will proceed. This dogma will be much disputed, yet it will be carried through. And then she said in 1951, I was co redemptrix from the moment of the Annunciation. The Mother has been constituted co redemptrix by the will of the Father. Tell this to your theologians. Tell them likewise that this dogma will be the last in Marian history. And finally, she says in 1953 to Ida, ask the Holy Father to pray the prayer and to lead all the nations in praying it. That, of course, is the prayer of Our Lady of All Nations. Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, teach your peoples this simple yet profound prayer. It is Mary, the Lady of All Nations, who asks this of you. You are the shepherd of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tend your sheep. Know well, great threats are hanging over the church, are hanging over the world. Now the time has come for you to speak of Mary as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate under the title Lady of All Nations. Why is Mary asking this of you? Because she has been sent by her Lord and Creator so that under this title and through this prayer, She may deliver the world from a great world catastrophe. She is now asking that the people may hear this title from you, the Holy Father. So that was in 1953. It seems that, you know, the grace has not yet been obtained for the Holy Father to proclaim that. We need to really pray and ask that grace. The final Marian apparition, which has a connection to both Fatima and to Amsterdam is Our Lady of Akita. Our Lady of Akita, she appeared to a sister in Japan in 1973. And the message is tied to Fatima because even Cardinal Ratzinger at the time said that the message of Akita is the message of Fatima. You might say Our Lady just wanted to make sure we understood the importance of Fatima and that not all has been done as she asked to once again to encourages and to even emphasize the connection with Fatima, the last apparition or the last message that Our Lady gave to Sister Agnes Sasagawa was on October 13, 1973. And when you hear that message, which I'll share with you shortly, you can see where there's a lot in that message that is taking place today. And it's connected to Amsterdam because the sisters 
this community in Japan, when they were wanting a statue of Our Lady for their chapel, they asked this Buddhist sculptor, he said, well, what kind of image do you want me to make? And so they handed him a holy card of Our Lady of All Nations. And so he constructed the, 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 the image of Our Lady in the chapel in Akita is Our Lady of All Nations, sculpted out of wood with Our Lady standing in front of the cross as she is depicted in that image. And that statue is really a very important focal point because many miracles were worked through that statue of Our Lady at Akita. The statue um, bled, sweat, and cried. And it cried 101 times over about a period of uh, almost about six years. Uh, and all the, the blood, the sweat, and the tears were all proven to be human blood, sweat, and tears. It says here, Two years later, on January 4th, 1975, the statue of the Blessed Virgin began to weep. It continued to weep at intervals for the next six years and eight months. The tears were scientifically proven to be human tears by Professor Sagisati of the University of Akita. And the statue from which the voice came wept 101 times over a course of several years. And it ended, the weeping ended on the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows, September 15, 1981. It also perspired abundantly, and the perspiration sent out a sweet perfume. Its right hand bled from a wound that had the form of a cross. And when the statue bled, it bled Our Lady's right hand bled in the palm of her hand, the statue, and Sister Agnes Asagawa had the stigmata in her left hand in the same position and manner, same kind of sign as the statue, and they both bled at the same time. But the statue bled longer than Sister. It would always begin on Thursday and end on Sunday. And Sister had this for five weeks and consistently, the, the bleeding of the statue. And the Sister said that the blood would drip from the hand of the statue as it would leave the hand of the statue would disappear in thin air, and they never found any blood on the floor of the chapel. It miraculously disappeared before it hit the ground. Hundreds of people witnessed many of these events of the blood, tears, and it says that the tears, blood, and perspiration had three blood groups, O, B, and A, B. So Our Lady was using that, I think, as a way to emphasize the supernatural character and the importance of her messages. But the two last messages of Our Lady of Akita are very important, for she said on August 3, 1973, Many men in this world afflict the Lord. I desire souls to console him, to soften the anger of the Heavenly Father. I wish with my son for souls who will repair by their suffering and their poverty for the sinners and ingrates, in order that the world might know his anger the Heavenly Father is preparing to inflict a great chastisement on all mankind. With my Son, I have intervened so many times to appease the wrath of the Father. I have prevented the coming of calamities by offering Him the sufferings of the Son on the cross, His precious blood and beloved souls who console Him, forming a cohort of victim souls. Prayer, penance, and courageous sacrifices can soften the Father's anger. I desire this also from your community, that it love poverty, that it sanctify itself and pray in reparation for the ingratitude and outrages of so many men. And she told them to recite this prayer that they had prayed in their community in reparation for the insults and sacrileges against the Blessed Sacrament. Finally, on October 13, 1973, on the anniversary of Our Lady's Miracle of the Sun, she told Sister Agnes, speaking to her, and Sister Agnes was deaf at the time. She couldn't hear anybody else, but she could always hear Our Lady speaking to her, and she would always understand that the voice was emanating from the statue of Our Lady in their chapel. She said this, As I told you, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict the terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge, than the great flood, such as one will never seen before. 
Fire will fall from the sky and will wipe out a great part of humanity, the good as well as the bad, sparing neither priests nor faithful. The survivors will find themselves so desolate that they will envy the dead. The only arms which will remain for you will be the rosary and the sign left by my son. It's not sure exactly what the sign left by my son is. i am not heard a good explanation of what that may be. Each day recite the prayers of the rosary. With the rosary, pray for the pope, the bishops, and priests. The work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against bishops. The priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their confreres, churches and altars sacked. No, that could be, you know, in some places where churches are being, I think this is the recovation that has taken place in many cases with post-Vatican II, so many churches were sacked, you might say, by the liturgical vandals in many cases. The church will be full of those who accept compromises, and the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. The demon will be especially implacable against souls consecrated to God. The thought of the loss of so many souls is the cause of my sadness. If sins increase in number and gravity, there will be no longer pardon for them. With courage, speak to your superior. He will know how to encourage each one of you to pray and to accomplish works of reparation. It is Bishop Ito who directs your community. And so Our Lady said finally at the last, she said, pray very much the prayers of the rosary. I alone am able to save you from the calamities which approach. Those who place their confidence in me will be saved. That's a strong message of Our Lady of of Akita, but it's an approved apparition by Bishop Ito. And it seems to me if one can, you would have to be kind of blind not to see that many cases with the mention of cardinals against cardinal and bishop against bishop, that these things are taking place today, very much so. So we need to take up Our Lady's, you know, remedy that she gives us to pray the rosary and to be mindful of that. But the co-redemption is even brought out even more clearly in the message of Akita because of this crying of Our Lady 101 times. Sister Agnes was pondering, well, what is the significance of 101 times? Why 101? Why not 100? Not 102, but 101. And one day, Sister Agnes's guardian angel appeared to her and with a Bible. And the angel, guardian angel, opened the Bible and pointed to a, a specific verse which Sister Agnes Sasagawa recognized immediately as Genesis 3.15. I'll put enmities between thee and the woman and thy seed and her seed, She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. The angel explained to her, There is a meaning to the number 101. It means that sin, that sin has entered into the world by a woman, the first Eve, and it is by a woman that will come the salvation, the second Eve, Our Lady. The zero between the two ones represent the eternal God being from all eternity and until the end of time. You know, he's, he's God. He's eternal. The first one represents, of course, Eve, and the second one, the Virgin Mary. And this first Eve of the first Adam and the first Eve goes way back to St. Irenaeus, who brings out this, this fulfillment, this recapitulation that the first Eve and the first Adam were the result of our fall, and that the first Adam was influenced by the first Eve. She didn't, she's not the one that, you know, it's the, it's the sin of Adam that caused all of us to be uh, conceived in original sin, but Eve had a part to play in that. And so in the, in the second Eve and the second Adam, Christ and Our Lady, Christ being the, the second Adam, the new Adam, 
his work of redemption also need, not because God had to do it this way, but because God willed to do it this way, the second Eve, the new Eve, Our Lady, had a part to play. You know, that even when the Protestants say Christ alone, well, to say Christ alone, you're talking about Christ means the second person united to a human nature. And he didn't make that human nature out of thin air. He took that human nature from his mother, Our Lady. So with that, I just point out to you the, that there is this co-redemptive golden thread running throughout the Marian apparitions since 1830 especially, and all the ones that are really of some prominence and ones that seem to have been given a lot of attention. Some will tell you, well, um, of course, the messages of Our Lady of Amsterdam were approved by the bishop there in 2000. You may find online somewhere where they'll say, well, the Vatican Commission in 1972 said that it was, you know, condemned something, but it doesn't seem that there's a, you know, no one's ever contradicted the bishop in 2000 for making, saying that he believed that there's something supernatural about the messages. And obviously, about that same time that the Vatican was expressing some doubts about the message of Our Lady at uh, Amsterdam, comes along this supernatural wonder in Akita with a, with a statue of Our Lady of, a, of All Nations which bled, sweat, and cried and many miraculous events to maybe, let's say, heaven saying, maybe there's a correction you need to make there. Your, your assumptions may be wrong. But anyway, Akita was approved by Bishop Sasagawa and it's the only, you might say, the bishop's approval. No one in the Vatican has ever den- uh, contradicted his approval. And as I said, Cardinal Ratzinger, when Bishop Ito went to see Cardinal Ratzinger, said that the message of Akita is the message of Fatima. So we need to really, I think, take notice of that. To pray, and pray especially when we pray the rosary, that Our Lady's fifth Marian and final Marian dogma will be proclaimed a dogma of the Church. I think that's where the era of peace that Our Lady asked for at Fatima will come about, and that the triumph of her Immaculate Heart really has to be the proclamation of the fifth Marian dogma. It cannot be otherwise, I do not believe, until we have everybody who's Catholic acknowledging Our Lady's role in the work of redemption. We'll work on the Protestants later, but we have to get Catholics all on the same page and to recognize that Our Lady has not some minor role to play, but a very important role in the work of our redemption. She is our co-redemptrix, our co-redemptrix uh, and our mother in the work of co-redemption. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.